I'm now going to show you how to use the SPSS mixed procedure to carry out a repeated measures analysis. And this would be uh, comparable to a repeated measures ANOVA. So first you see I've got um, my data set here and I've got it in long form. And long form means that for each of my uh, subjects, and here you have subject one, I have a separate row for each one of their time point measures. And you see here's my time one, two, three, four, five. There's their measure at different time points. Um, and then what I've got is uh, my data for subject two. But you see subject two only showed up for one appointment. And so I'm missing data here. Now, in the normal repeated measures analysis of variance, this patient would drop out. I wouldn't have their data because they don't have complete data. The wonderful thing about the mixed procedure or random effects uh, procedure is that I can include um, cases where I have incomplete data. So let me show you how to set that up. So we'll go up to Analyze, Mixed Models, and we're going to use Linear. Now, what I've got here, let me go ahead and reset this. What I want here, I've got two pieces of information that I need to tell SPSS so I can set up the model. Uh, the first is what's called the subjects level. Now this is within subjects data, that is to say each subject has multiple measures um, on each, you know, say physiological parameter. And so what I need to do is I need to set up, um, tell SPSS what my subjects level data, and this is my second level uh, in the kind of multi-level analysis. If uh, patient measures at each one of the time points is my first level, then the subject is my second level. So I'm going to put that in there. Um, then I'm going to put my repeated measure, uh, and here I have multiple measures over time. I'm going to put that here. Now you don't want to put, even though I know my excess weight loss, which is what I'm looking at, is my outcome variable. Uh, that's not my repeated measure. My repeated measure is uh, a, a measure that I've set up here and called time and I created another YouTube video to show you how to set that up. Now, the last piece of information that we need to give SPSS in order to carry out our analysis is what is the structure of the cov uh, covariance matrix. Now, there are a number of different structures here, and these words probably don't mean any sense at all uh, to you initially. SPSS has a uh, help site where they, they tell you what all these different words mean. But essentially what we're going to go with initially for our baseline model is compound symmetry. Because compound symmetry is roughly the assumption we would make under a, um, a, 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 a classic analysis of variance where my, my groups, in this case my time point measures, have the same um, variance. Right? We have uh, homogeneous variances and that we also have symmetry, that is to say uh, the uh, variance between each one of the time points uh, is the same. So this is going to be our baseline model. Now we already know from initial screening that for this particular case, this is not, you know, for this particular analysis, compound symmetry isn't right. We know that it's wrong, but we need a baseline model to compare our um, variations in the model that we're going to make against. So this is going to be our comparison. So we'll click continue. And then we have our uh, dialog that looks very much like many of the other SPSS dialogs. Our dependent variable is our excess weight loss. We'll move that over. And now we want to put in our time, uh, which is our time variable, as, as a factor. Now with the mixed procedure, we need to then tell SPSS, and right now we're going to keep it very simple. Um, we're going to tell SPSS what fixed variables uh, we want in our model and we just have time. So I'm going to add that and then click continue. Now I'm not including any random effects in my baseline model so I don't even need to mess with that. Um, estimation, um, I can either select the re restricted maximum likelihood or maximum likelihood. Uh, if you have random effects, um, some of the research indicates that restrictive mac restricted maximum likelihood may be more uh, accurate uh, in practice, there's often very little difference. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use uh, maximum likelihood here. Uh, then we'll go down to statistics. Um, you have a lot of different options. The ones you really want to pick up are parameter estimates and tests of covariance parameters. 
Those are the two key ones right now. Then I'm going to go ahead and grab the estimated marginal means for each one of the time points. And what this will do is tell me what was the excess weight loss at one month, three months, six month, nine month, which is how I've set up my uh, data. Um, so this is going to give me the means at those time points. So um, uh, with the save, if I wanted to save residuals for uh, further analyses, were my assumptions valid or uh, warranted? Uh, I could do that under here, but I'm not going to right now because I just want to show you this. And I click OK. And then we see our output. In the top table, we see our model dimensions. I see that um, my repeated uh, effects was time. I used compound symmetry as the covariance structure. And I have seven de uh, degrees of freedom here. Um, I also have 1172 subjects. Now, if I, because I've done this, if I carried out the same analysis, in the classic repeated measures NOVA, I would have only about 300 patients here. So you can see how the size of my data set has dramatic, or usable data set, has dramatically expanded because I'm using this procedure. Now the information criteria is particularly important because this is how much error is left in my model. Um, what I want to do as I now compare this baseline model to further uh, models is I'm going to compare uh, the uh, information criteria, whichever one I choose, and uh, the most frequently used ones I see are, are either the Kiki's or the uh, Schwartz Bayesian. Um, sometimes they see negative two log likelihood. Basically, what I want to happen is in my future models, I want this number to go down because remember, this is how much error is left in my model. So, it, with model improvements, my hope is that the amount of error will decrease. So then we see that time was in fact significant. This is no surprise. We know that people change weight over time in response to surgery. Um, then I have my estimates of fixed effects. Um, and so here you can see the way this is set up, the um, overall model intercept is the intercept for my last time period. And you can see that um, time one, which uh, one month, three months, six month, nine month, uh, were all somewhat less uh, had lower percent weight loss than they did at uh, the last time point. Now this is a little confusing, or can be, and that's why I grab my estimated marginal means here, because here I can see that the average uh, percent uh, excess weight loss at one month was 17%. It was 30% at th three months, 38%, and so you can see how it changes over time. Uh, because I don't have any random effects in my model, uh, the covariance parameter really isn't that important, but it will be later on when I start putting in different effects. Now, what I need to do now is I've got this, remember we ran this model and I used compound symmetry, which we know ahead of time is wrong. So let me show you how to change that to something more reasonable. Let me go analyze, go back to mixed, linear. I don't need to change anything here, but what I am going to do is uh, change the structure of my uh, covariance matrix. And I'm going to change this to AR1 heterogeneous. Now, again, I'm, you know, I don't have time in this uh, little how-to tutorial to explain all these, but basically this is telling me that I have, uh, I'm allowing for heterogeneous variances at the different time points. And I'm, I'm telling SPSS that the the measures at the different time points are related, they're correlated, and they're correlated in a certain way where the strength of the correlation between each adjacent time point is getting weaker and weaker over time. And this is actually a very common pattern in health science uh, research to see this, uh, this AR1 heterogeneous. So I'm going to click OK. And now what I need to do is all I've done is told, I've made one change, and that is I've told SPSS how the uh, my measures at different time points are related to each other. Um, so there's nothing else that I need to, to check in here. Uh, everything else is set up and what we want to see is is changing the structure of the covariance matrix, does that really make a difference in terms of the outcomes of uh, our model? So let's click OK. And then what we see is now we see our model dimensions has told me my repeated effect is still time, but this time I'm using this different kind of the heterogeneous first order autoregressive 
um, covariance structure. Still have you know uh, my patients here, and here's what. Look at what happened. Um, now I have my negative two log likelihood is 26.095. Let's compare it to what we had before. 28. 050, and we know that these are related in the chi-square distribution, so if I subtract uh, the second, um, say negative 2 log likelihood, the AIC, the BIC, from the initial, that's going to give me my, my chi-square. My degree of freedom is simply going to be, um, I have 11 parameters here, so 11 minus 7, okay, and that's going to give me uh, my degree of freedom for the chi-square. I can tell you right now, um, I, that that's highly significant. If you don't believe me, go plug that into a an online chi-square p-value calculator and you'll see that it's highly significant. And so what I've done is I have significantly improved the um, fit of my model just by specifying a much more realistic um, covariance structure. And I've also, again, one of the huge benefits of this procedure over the classic uh, repeated measure analysis of variances, I don't have to have complete data. I can actually use information, incomplete information that I get from my different patients. Um, so then we see down here uh, the uh, fixed effects and my estimated marginal means really haven't changed. But one of the things I can also check on is um, in the covariance parameter table, I have now a row for my covariance structure. And if it was properly specified, then I should see this as significant, although that's not surprising since, again, we already tested using the information criteria to see was it a significant improvement, and we saw that it was. So that's pretty much how you uh, carry out the mixed procedure um, uh, using or, or carry out a repeated measures, roughly an analysis of variance, um, using the mixed procedure. And again, I could get more complex uh, using my mixed procedure, so now I could start to build in uh, different covariates, uh, different fixed factors. Let's say I wanted to know is there a difference by procedure, uh, because this, this data set has three different surgical procedures. Was there a difference by hospital, surgeon, surgeon may be a random effect, etc., etc. So then I could begin to build out my model uh, in a more uh, nuanced way. So that's how you set it up.